we're about to kick off a series um, this morning called Spirit Led. And uh, I promised you last week when, uh, at, over Easter, for those of you here for Easter, that, uh, that we're going to continue Easter. We talked about the fact that on Easter Sunday, or Good Friday, Kaz, if you were here, um, you will remember this if you weren't, Kaz really unpacked crucifixion. The, the physical and the emotional and the spiritual and the mental side of what happens when someone is crucified. When Jesus was crucified, what actually happened? And, and um, you know, we could have heard a pin drop at the end of Good Friday. And we said at the end of Good Friday, the story's not over. Come back Sunday to hear more of the story. And then we came back on Sunday and, uh, and I shared around the concept that when Jesus was on the cross, one of the last things he said was, it is, say it with me. It is finished. Some of you are listening. Awesome. You know, we talked about the fact that Jesus said, it is finished. And we weren't saying that he's finished, but his work on this earth is finished. And a powerful moment when we understand that, when we start to unpack that and see what that's like. And we talked about the fact that, that we are Easter people because of what happened. Good Friday. And then not only it is finished, but then we recognise the idea of the empty tomb and the fact that he is risen. But I said we're Easter people and I said I feel like too often churches generally, and I'm not, this is not about bagging churches, but too often we as the church move on and we're like, well, Easter was last weekend, we're going on to this new series now, and we kind of move forward. And, I, and, I, and I, as I was thinking about the preparation for last Sunday, and I mentioned this to you, I feel like sometimes we need to stop and go, no, 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 every Sunday, yeah. every Sunday, it is finished, he is risen. Yeah. Every Sunday. Yeah. We are Easter people. But we move on too quickly. So what helps us to stay in the understanding and live in, as Easter people every day of our lives? Jesus was teaching his disciples prior to his death and resurrection. And in John chapter 14 and verse 12, I think I got this through in time I did. Um, Jesus was teaching this. He said, I tell you the truth. He's saying to his disciples. So anytime he speaks to anyone, I listen. But particularly when he's speaking to his disciples, because you know, he says that we are his followers. We are his disciples. Those of us who are, who are here and have accepted Jesus. He says, I tell you the truth, Murray. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done. Murray, do you believe in me? Yes. Then I tell you the truth, Highlands. Anyone who believes in me will do the same works I've done. And then he says, actually, even greater works because I am going to be with the Father. Now, when I read that, I go, hang on a minute. You're telling me, Jesus, that I'm going to do, I'm going to do the works that you did. In fact, I'm going to do greater works than you. And then the next line is, and I think to myself, well, if that's the case, I need you, Jesus. But he says to his disciples, you're going to do the works that I've done. In fact, you're going to do greater things. And then in the very next line, he says, because I'm going to be with the Father. I'm like, well, hang on a minute. I get it if you're with me, if you're standing there. I feel empowered when you're right there with me. But you're saying you're going to be with the Father. You can ask for anything in my name and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. This morning, I want us to understand the power of, of what it meant when Jesus said and did go to be with his father. Because what he brought, what father and son organised for us, better still, who he organised for us to come and dwell within us, empowers us to do incredible things in the name of Jesus. Let's pray. Father, as we unpack what it means to be Easter people, what it means to be followers of you, what it means to be spirit-led, I pray this morning, Lord, that you would remove the veil, you would remove the, the uh, scales from our eyes, our spiritual eyes, that we might see who we are in you and what that means for our lives moving forward. In Jesus' name. See, the inference on that scripture is that Jesus is saying, I'm going, but someone is coming to empower you to do even greater things in my name. I'm going to be with the Father, but we're going to send someone who's going to empower you, Murray, insert your name here, to live a life of power. To see God move powerfully in us, firstly, and through us. So let's go back to the moment in, scriptures, in the scriptures with what happens around 
the revelation of Jesus being risen. And then we'll take us on a bit of a journey beyond Easter from there. But I want to start back with that Easter story in, 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 in a short um, sort of a, a uh, summarized version. John 20 and verse, uh, verse 1 says this. What was happening was Mary and, and the other woman were taking, sp- there were other women, the th- I think there were th- three of them, that were taking spices to the tomb. They were taking spices to where Jesus had been laid to anoint Jesus' body. And as they were going, they were sort of saying, well, how are we going to do this? There's a huge stone. But when they got there, they realized the stone had been rolled away. And we mentioned last week that the stone wasn't, stone wasn't rolled away so Jesus could get out. Because we know that over the next few days after resurrection, Jesus was just arriving anywhere. He was in a, all of a sudden, he wasn't in a room, and then he was in a room. It wasn't for Jesus to get The stone was rolled away so that the women, so people could get in to see that he was risen. We mentioned that last week. So anyway, she realized that they realized the stone's been rolled away, and, and, and um, Mary and the women ran and told Simon Peter. And in, in John, he refers to himself as the other disciple. Which is really interesting. I thought, why, why, why doesn't John say Peter and I? So in the Gospel of John, so in the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. In the Gospel of John, John wrote it and he refers to himself. But he doesn't refer to himself as John or me. He says the other disciple. He always refers to himself in the third person, not the first person. So let's have a look at it. Early on Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb and found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the other disciple to whom Jesus loved. Do you know who wrote that? Just letting you know the disciple Jesus loved. Let's keep going. I love John. I think he's fantastic. He He stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there. But he didn't go in. Actually, did we miss a verse? Let me just come back. Maybe we missed I reckon we missed something there. I'm going, to, I'm going to read it again. Early in Sunday morning, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene came to the tomb uh, that had been rolled away from the entrance. She ran and found Simon Peter and the, other, and the other disciple whom Jesus loved. And they said, they have taken the Lord's body out of the tomb. So we don't know where, to, where they have put him. Peter and the other disciple whom Jesus loved, started out for the tomb. They were both running, but the other disciple outran Peter and reached the tomb first. (laughs) The other disciple, me, I'm faster than Peter. I love this. How real is this? He's writing about himself and he he wants to be humble, so he doesn't mention his name. But I'm the one that Jesus loved and I'm faster than Peter. When you read the scriptures and you understand the context, seriously, these disciples are so far. Anyway, so we move on. He stopped, he stooped and looked in and saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he didn't go in. Then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He didn't say, I was a bit scared, so I let Peter go in. The other disciples stood back. No, no, no. He stooped and looked in and saw, and then Simon Peter arrived and went inside. He noticed the linen wrappings lying there while the cloth had been covered that had covered Jesus' head, was folded up, lying apart from the other wrappings. Then the disciple, who reached the tomb first, just making sure we know, also went in and saw and believed. For until then, they still hadn't understood the scriptures that said Jesus must rise from the the dead. And then they went home. You know, when we read the scriptures and we read with a sense to understand, not only do we get the facts, but we get an understanding of the humanity of Jesus and the humanity of the disciples. I fell more in love with John when I read that. I thought that is so cool. We all all deal with it. Interestingly, I started to think about that story and the way John presents it. And it made me start to think about John and his whole family. And his whole family were pretty competitive. Check out John's mother, Salome, Salome whose early request to Jesus was something that was pretty competitive too. In Matthew chapter 20, and this has nothing to do with my message, but I just think it's great for us to understand the competitive nature of, of the disciples. Matthew 20 verse 20 says, Then the mother of James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came to Jesus with her sons. So she comes with John, son of Jesus' love, and James. And she comes to Jesus and she knelt respectfully at Jesus and she asks a favour. What is your request? Jesus asks, and she replied, In your kingdom, please let my son sit at places of honour next to you, one on your right hand and one on your left hand. So she's like, I know you love everybody, but can my sons have that special place? 
Now we'll go, oh dear, that's a bit big ask, but how many parents wouldn't want that for their kids? You know what I mean? Hey Jesus, I know you love everybody, but hey, Brooke and Casey, can you just, right hand, left hand, you know, a little, little bit more, you know, you said that you loved him more than, you know, can you do something here? I love that. But Jesus answered by saying, you don't know what you're asking. You are, you, are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering that I'm about to drink and Jesus then goes on and talks about the heart to serve and the heart of service and he, he t- turns into a beautiful teaching he doesn't rebuke John and, and James's mum he just talks about the heart of service in that moment but I just love the nature and I'd encourage you as you read the scripture some of you say oh the Bible's dry I, so pray ask God God would you reveal the truth and the life of the Bible because when you do and you read it and you, you start to understand some of the context it just does come alive and not only does it help us to understand the facts it takes us into the context of what was happening at the time and the humanity of some of these people and I don't know about you but I can relate far more when I see that anyway let's get back let's get back to the to the journey here the journey that we're on. So after Jesus' resurrection, the disciples were hidden away. So Jesus resurrected, the stone's been rolled away, he's not here. The disciples don't know what's going on. They hide away and they're having a meet, meeting, doors closed, hidden away, and Jesus all of a sudden just appears. Now we're going to go through a bit of scripture today and I, I hope you understand that we believe the Bible is God, God's inspired word for us. And so as we go through the scriptures, I'm believing that God is going to reveal truth to you in a new way. But John chapter 20 talks about this moment where he says that Sunday evening, the disciples were meeting behind locked doors because they were afraid of the Jewish leaders. Remember, Jesus was no longer there and they didn't know what had happened. We, We know hindsight resurrected. They just don't know what's going on. Suddenly, out of nowhere, Jesus was standing there amongst them and he says, peace be with you. And as he spoke, he showed them the wounds in his hands and the wounds um, on his side. They were filled with joy when they saw the Lord. And again, he said, peace be with you. He recognized what they were going through. Peace be with you. And as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. And then he breathed on them. And he said, receive the Holy Spirit. Catch this. First time they see him. In a room. They've been freaking out. They see him come back. And he says, receive the Holy Spirit. Peace. Peace be with you. Now, receive Holy Spirit. Many of us know that the Godhead is made up of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. All persons of God. So we don't refer to the Holy Spirit as it. Scriptures talk about him, the Holy Spirit. Person of the Holy Spirit. And he says, receive the person of the Holy Spirit. The Gospel of Luke, Jesus speaks about this filling of the Holy Spirit this way. Luke 24, 48 says, And now I will send the Holy Spirit just as the Father promised. Stay here in the city until the Holy Spirit comes upon you and fills you with power from heaven. So we talk about receive the Holy Spirit and then there's other times where Jesus says, Now be filled with the Holy Spirit. When power comes upon you. And then later, during his time while he was resurrected before he ascended into heaven. So when he started to walk the earth for that 40 odd days before his actual ascension into heaven. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 4 we read this. About Jesus teaching and bringing and inspiring and encouraging us to understand the fullness of what it means to live with the Holy Spirit in us. He says once... When he was eating with them, Jesus commanded them, Do not leave Jerusalem until the Father sends you the gift he promised. As I told you before, John the Baptist baptized with water. But in a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So again, we can receive the Holy Spirit. We can be filled and baptized in the Holy Spirit. And over the next month, I'd encourage you to keep coming back because we're going to unpack each of those. What does it mean then, Murray, to be, to be touched by the Holy Spirit? What does it mean to have the Holy Spirit live within me? What does it mean to be filled to overflowing and then baptised in the Holy Spirit? What does all that mean? We're going to help you and help you to understand that. But today in this introduction, I want you to understand that Jesus left and went back to be with the Father so that we could be empowered by the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit would live with us. So we would know Jesus and know God through the Spirit. And we're going to talk a little bit about that in the next few moments. 
Verse 6, so when the apostles were with Jesus, they kept asking him, Lord, has the time come for you to free Israel and restore the kingdom? And he replied, the Father alone has the authority to set those dates and times. and They are not for you to know. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit... When? You will receive power when... Not if. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you. And you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, in Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about people say, oh, how, how, do I, how do I share Jesus? I love Jesus, and God is, is so important to me. I want others to know about it. How do I do that? Because I just don't feel like I'm worthy. I don't feel like I have the knowledge. I don't feel like I, I've had the right words. I don't feel like I can honor God enough. Jesus makes it really clear. He says, the Holy Spirit will empower you to be my witnesses. That's good news because it means, Murray, you don't have to stress about this. The way you live your life, and if you're always ready to give a reason for the hope that you have, the words that you use, Spirit, Holy Spirit will bring that to you in your way, the way you are. Because I don't know about you, but sometimes the whole idea of me, I want my family and my friends to know Jesus like I do. But but I'm not sure. I don't want to wreck it. So how do I do that? Murray, peace be with you. Because I'm going so the Holy Spirit will come to empower you so you will receive power to be my witnesses. So the first truth that I want us to understand today about the Holy Spirit is that the Holy Spirit fills us with power from heaven. If you're taking notes, the Holy Spirit, I want you to write it in the first person. The Holy Spirit fills me with power from heaven. Why did Jesus have to go to be with the Father? Because his work here was done and there was a role of the other part of the God here, the Holy Spirit, to come and to dwell within us that we would receive power from heaven. And Christians, I believe that so many of us don't get this and we live our lives in our own strength and God says, I want to breathe power into your life through my spirit. And it's not spooky, ooky, wooky. God says, I made you the way you are and I'm, going to put, I'm not going to make you completely this weird person. I'm going to bring change, but to who you are. Because I created you. I knew you before you were born, you were born the Bible says. God says, I knew you before you were born. And I planned every day of your life. I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and to harm you. Not to give you, to give you a hope in the future. I've made you a certain way, but I'm breathing Holy Spirit in you. So you have, you have God leading, guiding and directing. And so many of us miss it. And we live our lives knowing about God, knowing about Jesus, knowing about the Holy Spirit, but not actually allowing Holy Spirit to truly move in our lives. And our prayer for this month is that God will drop something in you and you'll recognize that still small voice of the Holy Spirit and you'll come alive in the things of him. And my prayer is that as we preach this series over the next few weeks that we can take what sometimes Christians and sometimes the world feels is a bit spooky and a bit weird holy ghost holy spirit don't understand and bring it away as the scriptures designed it for us to get it for us to know and to go on the journey with god so holy spirit fills us with power from heaven and part of that power is for us that we might be able to go out in the world and live a life with our words and our actions where people will come to know him After saying this in Acts 1, um, Jesus goes to Bethany where he blesses his disciples, lifts his hands and then ascends into heaven. How amazing would that have been? Just segue. Imagine being there in that moment. Bless you. God be with you. Holy Spirit's now with you. See ya. (laughs) Just would have been amazing to be there in that moment. Not long after this, on what they call the day of Pentecost, it was recorded in Acts chapter 2, this idea of this baptism of holy spirit and everyone the scriptures in acts 2 4 says everyone was who was present was filled to overflowing that the word filled there is a filling to overflowing with the holy spirit and began speaking in other languages as the holy spirit gave them this ability and over the next few weeks we're going to talk about what does that mean baptizing the holy spirit speaking in tongues what does that mean is that that sounds a bit freaky too what is that all about and we'll unpack that in more detail but today i wanted to just talk about a few different ways holy spirit moves and then we'll take some of those and unpack in more detail so stay tuned with that but one of the truth is that we can be filled with the holy spirit and god gives us a way of worshiping him to new levels 
through this baptism of the Holy Spirit, that we can edify him in ways where we just speak in, in a new tongue. And, and for me, it was powerful. For me, not brought up in a Christian home in my mid-20s, this was kind of strange for me, but I was open. I just said, God, whatever is of you, I want. And five weeks after I put up my hand and asked Jesus, to, said yes to Jesus and asked Jesus into my life, I was baptised in water and I come up, came up out of the water speaking in tongues. Sounded like baby language, to be honest with you. It was sort of but, 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 but I was just open. Yeah. And I didn't understand it fully, but my attitude was, God, whatever you have, whatever you have, I want to be a part of all of that. And I hope and pray that that's your prayer, that you would be open to whatever God has for you. Later that day in Acts chapter 2, verse 32, Peter and his 11 disciples step forward and Peter's recorded preaching to the crowd. And he, Peter says this, he said, God raised Jesus from the dead and we are all witnesses of this. Now he is exalted to the place of highest honour in heaven at God's right hand. And then he says, and the Father, as he promised, gave him the Holy Spirit, gave Jesus the Holy Spirit to pour out on us just as he has and just as we've seen today. And that pouring out of the Holy Spirit wasn't just for Pentecost. Scriptures say the pouring out of the Holy Spirit continues and it continues and it continues and it continues. Now, I don't know what your, your, um, um, your background is in terms of church, whether, whether you've had much teaching on Holy Spirit, whether you're new to, to church and to God and, and to Jesus and you're dipping your toe in the water. But I want to say to you that this is so important to understand because when we are open to Holy Spirit moving, there is incredible power that comes into our life in so many different ways. What I want us to glean today is that Jesus was very clear that after his death on the cross and his resurrection, the, the empty cross, it is finished, and the empty tomb, he is risen, the Holy Spirit, it was the next part. It wasn't just like, oh, well, and by the... No, no, no. Part of the journey of Easter, that first Easter was, the continuation, the Holy Spirit would be sent to us to bear witness, to bear witness to God and to Jesus. That's why we say our God is not a distant God. That's why we say that Jesus speaks into our heart. That's why we say we invite Jesus in and he comes and dwells within us because Holy Spirit comes to lead and guide and direct. So the good news is we don't cry out to a God who is distant and hope he might hear. The good news is through his spirit, he is with us. He's with us. And he's speaking. And he's encouraging. God has sent his Holy Spirit to be our guide, to be our companion, to be our comforter, to be our empowerer, our empowerer, to give direction, to be our protector when we feel like things are coming at us, to be our healer, to come and to bring truth, to calm fears, to fill us with hope, to express love, and to bring freedom. I don't bet you, but I want to know the person of the Holy Spirit. If that's what he wants to bring into my life, come Holy Spirit, fall afresh on me. See, we sing about the Holy Spirit. I want us to understand. I want us to be a church that is led, that is filled, that is empowered, that is comforted, that is guided, that is directed, that fears are calmed, that brings hope because of the Holy Spirit alive in us. Again, Another teaching, if you're not sure about this Holy Spirit gig that I'm talking about, Jesus taught the disciples in John chapter 16 when he says, when the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the Spirit of truth comes upon you, he will guide you into all truth. If you want to understand the truths of the scripture, Murray, it's hard. I try and read and I just, I don't get it. You know, you talked about, you know, how can you read that and see the funny side of John? Well, how do you get that? Holy Spirit, as I open your word. Would you guide me? Would you open my eyes to what you want me to learn about you, God, about you, Holy Spirit, about you, Jesus, and about me? See, when we invite him into those spaces and he moves and he brings truth and he guides us in all truth, he will not speak truth on his own, but he will tell you what he has heard. Holy Spirit won't just, whatever, he'll tell you what God is saying 
And he will tell you about future. He'll guide you and direct you in your future. You've got decisions you need to make. Should I change jobs here? Is this a relationship I should pursue? Financially, I'm not sure what to do here. This, this person, I'm, not, I'm, I'm concerned about this person. Holy Spirit, lead me. Give me wisdom. Give me guidance. God, by your spirit, direct me. Direct me. See, the truth is, if you want guidance in your life, if you want understanding in your life, ask God by his spirit. Ask the Holy Spirit. See, prayer is not just, I'm going to give you a list of all the things that, are, that, that I'm struggling with in my life, although God wants to hear those. Prayer is seeking God by his spirit to come and to bring truth. Prayer is asking God by his spirit to come to bring answers. Prayer is to come by his spirit and to create freedom with this relationship that Liz expressed so beautifully as she hosted today about what prayer truly is about, was this beautiful community relationship that we have with the Father. Guidance and truth. So what does that look like practically, Murray? What, what do you mean? What does that look like practically? Well, give you, let me give you an example from my life, um, and I'll give you some big ones. God, God loves to speak into the small detail, but I'll give you a couple of big ones. Because if, I think if we talk about the big ones and we understand, well, he can speak. If he talks about that, he can talk about and speak into the small stuff as well. At a, a church that we were pastoring, we had planted down in Melbourne <clears throat> quite a few years ago now. Um, it would be probably 15 years ago, I, I guess, um, that we'd planted. And, and the church was growing and developing and, and things were going really well. And, and there were some key people in the life of the church that had this idea, this thought that they, they thought the church could, should, should head in a certain direction. And uh, they, were, they were powerful people, strong people. Some of them were friends of, of Kaz and mine. But they, they, they felt the church should go in a certain direction. And they came and they shared and talked about that and what it might look like and, and who should be involved. And it just wasn't sitting right with me. But I respected the people that were talking to me. And so I was in this wrestle about, well, you know, it's not sitting right and, and what have you. And, and I just didn't know what to do. And as I was praying... The only way I can describe it is it felt like the Holy Spirit just whispered, come away with me, Murray. Come away from the noise. Because we had these friends and other people coming and saying, I think we should be doing this and I think we should be doing that. And there are all these ideas. And some of them sound like good ideas. It wasn't necessarily bad. But I just felt like he said, come, come away with me. I felt God wanted me to get away from the noise to be with him. And so I encouraged Kaz and she was praying and I went away in a bit of a prayer retreat and I just spent time and I just said, God, would you speak by your spirit and give me your clarity? And all I can say is God brought a real peace around the direction we were already heading in. It was like God said, stay on the track that you're on. Don't move to the left, don't move to the right, just stay on that track. And so we went back, we talked about it, we, we confirmed, we both felt the same thing, we went back and we did that. And that decision was, abs in hindsight, was absolutely right for the church. Now some people left because of that. Even friends of ours left because of that. But hindsight's a wonderful thing and God's revealed to us and shown us that um, the direction that they wanted to go and people that they wanted to give a little bit more um, opportunity or authority or power to, um, without going into detail, because it's not appropriate for me to do that, um, God reveals, yeah? God reveals truth further down the track and we were just on the right spot. Now, it would have been easy for me because these were God-fearing men and women who had these ideas for me to go, oh, that sounds good. Oh, I'm not too sure. Yeah, well, if you're thinking God's saying that, boom. But I went, no, no, no. God, what are you saying? And I felt God, and I just listened to that Holy Spirit, that still small voice saying, come away with me. Come away with me. Get away from the noise. Let's just make this you and me. And then what I got from God, I went to Kaz, we talked about, there was confirmation, we came back, we talked to the, the, the elders and we moved forward. Sometimes the busyness of life, things can come at us and the white noise is so loud we miss Holy Spirit just saying, hey, take a step back, come, come and be with me. Let, me. let me show you, let me guide you, let me lead you. He gives guidance, he gives understanding. 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 16 says, But when anyone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. Confusion is taken away. Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is 
If you want freedom this morning, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. Scriptures say, Holy Spirit lives with those of us who have invited God into our lives. Simply, you invite Jesus into your life and the Holy Spirit comes. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. And God wants to bring freedom. That doesn't mean they're not tough times. It doesn't mean we don't go through tough times. But ultimately, God wants to bring you freedom. God wants to bring you freedom. The Holy Spirit brings freedom and transformation. And as we continue to go to the Father, as we continue to go to the Holy Spirit, say, God, would you come? I need your healing. I need your freedom. I need you to remove the confusion. I need your freedom. I need to stop doing this stuff that I know, God, you're not happy with, but I'm not strong enough. God, would you come and bring your transformation by your Spirit? See, this is the beauty. There's no way I could live a life of a Christian the way that God wants me to live without Holy Spirit. And I fall short, continually I fall short of the glory of God. And I continually miss Holy Spirit's prompts and lead, leading and guiding and directing. But he's a loving father that says, keep coming back to me, Murray. Just like a muscle, as you keep trusting me, I'm going to continue to build in my voice. My Holy Spirit voice is going to be louder for you and louder for you. Right now you might go, I don't even know that I hear the Holy Spirit. Here's the good news. God is speaking. And as you turn your ear to him, I promise you that he will show you. You will hear him. You will see him through his spirit. Because he moves and shows us in so many different ways. Sometimes he prompts us in ways that we're not real happy about. To be a, being obedient to God is not always easy. But when you want freedom, you follow him. So that was a really good news story. Let me tell you one that's a lot tougher. I, um, I was just challenged very, very recently um, to give a gift to someone. I love, who loves giving gifts to people? Okay. Now, who loves giving gifts to people that you love? Who loves giving gifts to people that, that have hurt you? Oh, not too many hands going up. Again, without going into too much detail, I was out and um, there was someone, um, yeah, that, that um, I believe didn't deserve my blessing. Let me put it that way. And we were out and uh, God, through his Holy Spirit, just, just kept nagging. You know the Holy Spirit nags? How many knows the Holy Spirit nags? He kept nagging me about, Murray, I want you to do this for that person. Now, I want to honour, so I'm not going to go into the details of, of what happened, but this person really hurt myself and Kaz deeply, deeply. And it's still a little raw. I'm just being real with you now, okay? Still a little raw. Through that whole time that we're in the place that we're in, I want you to give this person, I want you to bless this person. I want you to bless this person. And I'm wrestling with it. I have no idea. We were, we were out with Dennis and Brooke and, and, uh, and Kaz and I, and we were chatting away, and I don't even know what they were talking about because I'm having this wrestle with God. Holy Spirit. And then it was just like God just reminded me, Murray, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who come against you. So I did. And I don't know what happened there. They didn't even know. They probably knew it was from me. I'm not sure. I don't know. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. The fruit of that doesn't matter. What I know that I know is that this side of that gift, there is a greater freedom in me. In that situation. If you'd mentioned that person's name three weeks ago, I would have said, yep, I've forgiven them. After listening to the Holy Spirit and doing something the Holy Spirit probably would do, I absolutely know I've forgiven them. Now, is there still pain? Of course. I'm not, you know, of course. But I'm in a different place, not because of who I am, but because the Holy Spirit knows what's best for me and he brings freedom. And so sometimes there are times where Holy Spirit nudges and we go, yeah, okay, great. Sometimes he nudges and we wrestle. And the wrestle's okay. But when we get to the point of going, I'm going to be obedient. I'm just, I'm just God, it's no longer I that live, but you that live in me. We sing all these songs. What's it mean when he says, I want you to do this? Or I want you to pray for that person? Or whatever it might be. 
Sometimes I get it right. Sometimes I miss it. Sometimes I don't act on the prompts of God. But every time I do, I know he brings freedom. And the final scripture I want to share with, with us in this introduction to Holy Spirit is Romans chapter 8, verse 11, where the Apostle Paul writes, The Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Holy Spirit, the the power of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you and in me. And just as God raised Christ from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by the same Spirit living in you. You want to live real life? You want to live abundant life? You want to live a Holy Spirit alive life? Then one, if you haven't, Ask Jesus into your life because He wants to bring life, life everlasting, a life you've never experienced before. You hear this, live real life. Well, what's real? Real life is a life that's God-empowered. How does God empower when we ask Jesus to come? We say yes to Jesus and with Jesus comes the Holy Spirit. Have you ever heard or embraced the voice, the nudge, the direction, the comfort, the prompt, the freedom, the power that the Holy Spirit brings. This morning, if you're not yet a Christian, if you've not yet asked Jesus into your life, He wants to introduce you to the Holy Spirit. And this morning, for those of us who who would say, I'm a follower of Jesus. I love Jesus. I believe this morning He wants to empower the Holy Spirit that's already in you. There's an empowering that the Holy Spirit wants to bring to us today if we're open to Him. Wherever you're at in your journey, I don't care if you've been a Christian 100 years or you're still just dipping your toe in the water of faith. I totally believe this morning, Holy Spirit wants to move in your life right now. Are you open to Him? Let's pray. Oh God, you are so, so wise. And yet we, we look for moments and we, we, we write things off and we say that's Easter and that's Christmas and that's Pentecost and that's that. And we want to tick boxes and we want to go to the next thing. And I just pray this morning, Lord God, that we would embrace the concept that we are Easter people that's, who celebrate the death and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus and the coming of the Holy Spirit. And so this morning, Lord God, I pray for every single person in this room, everyone who can hear the utterances of my voice. And I pray you would come alive in us, that your Holy Spirit would come alive in us, that we would would start to hear your voice, we would start to know your nudges, that we would know your comfort, we would know your power like never before, wherever we're at in our faith journey, Lord God. I pray a fresh wind of your Holy Spirit blow over this place right now in Jesus' name. From the front to the back, from the sides to the middle, your Holy Spirit would blow over each of us right now. That we would know your presence. We would know your love. We would know your power. We would know your comfort. We would know your freedom. We sing it, Father. Come, Holy Spirit. Fall afresh on us. Fill us with your power. Satisfy our needs. Only you can make us whole. Come, Holy Spirit. Fall afresh. You know, if you're here this morning, you've you've never thought about this concept of Jesus alive, that the, uh, uh, the concept of asking Jesus into our life, the concept of the Holy Spirit, that God wants to bring His Spirit in you to give you all that He created you to live out. You know, when Jesus died on the cross, as we're in this moment of prayer, when Jesus died on the cross, He looked at all of us throughout eternity with His arms wide on that, on that cross and He said, I'm doing this for you. It's finished. And then he rose again and defeated death and hell and he took on all of the sins of the world. He took your sins on. And then he rose again so that you and I might have life eternity. Eternal life. And so this morning, if you've never accepted 
Jesus' death and resurrection for you personally. If you've never invited Jesus into your life and said, I thank you, Jesus, you did that for me. I want to follow you. And I want to be led by your spirit. And if that's you this morning, like many of us in this room that have done that already, like I did in my mid-20s, not knowing much about God or Jesus, but just knowing I wanted him in my life. If that's you, I would love to pray for you just like somebody prayed for me. And the simple way of doing that in this moment of prayer is just so you can raise your hand so I can see your hand and I know who I'm praying for. But I want to pray for you that you might come to know him. So in this moment of prayer with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, if that's you and you say, you know what, I want to accept, I want to say yes to Jesus. Now is your moment. And just raise your hand so I know who I'm praying for right now. Over this place, from the front to the back, from the sides. Thank you, that's awesome. I see your hand. That's Praise God. Praise God. Praise God, I see your hand. That's awesome. That's fantastic. It's not important that I see your hand, but God in this moment is seeing your hands. There's two ladies here who are saying, I want Jesus in my life. Is there anyone else before I pray? I want Jesus. I don't want to do this life on my own anymore. I want to be led by God's Spirit. The angels are rejoicing right now because people are responding to Jesus. You know, if you raised your hand in that moment or the rest of the church, you may not have raised your hand, but in your heart of hearts, you know it's time for you to say yes to Jesus or come back to Him. Church, can we all just pray this simple prayer, a simple prayer that changes your eternity? Let's pray it together. Dear Jesus, thank you for that first Easter. When you died for me, you overcame death, You overcame sin, you overcame hell, and you rose again so that I might know you personally, God. So I receive you, Jesus, and I receive your Holy Spirit. Thank you, God, that you love me. I give my life to you. In Jesus' name.